Good day and welcome to Black Organizing on the Path to Power, Safety and Dignity Beyond Policing. I'm Mike Griffin, uh, organizer with here with the uh, Center for Com with Community Change. Uh, it's a national organization building power from the ground up. Uh, I'm teaming up here with the Black Freedom Collective, uh, which is a black led part of community change that um, works with a lot of grassroots organizations from all around the country. If you want to learn more about Community Change or the Black Freedom Collective, you can go to communitychangeaction.org. Today, we're going to be joined by three different organizations. Uh, but first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself again, Mike Griffin, organizer here with Community Change. Uh, I live here in Minneapolis, where we are next week about to have the one year anniversary of brother George Floyd being killed by the Minneapolis Police Department. Organizers who've lived in Minneapolis have been on the ground for years, fighting and organizing around policing reform. I was there the night that activists took over the third precinct. I had been building power in Minneapolis around policing since the death of Jamar Clark five years ago, he was shot in the back in North Minneapolis. Philando Castile killed in the suburbs of St. Paul. We know that this campaign was not just about getting justice for George Floyd. Our campaign was about actually making sure my life is valued in this country. So we're gonna have a discussion today, bringing in organizers from around the country. We got Prentice Haney from Ohio, uh, Dawn Blaygrove uh, from North Carolina and Ed Genesis. Uh, first, I'm gonna start with Dawn. And if you can just explain, Dawn, who you are, the focus of your organization and how you're showing up in this current moment. Sure, my name is Attorney Dawn. Hello, everybody. My name is Attorney Dawn Blaygrove. I'm the Executive Director of Emancipate NC. Emancipate NC is an organization that is committed to ending mass incarceration, dismantling systemic and institutional racism, and um, centering the voices, voices and living experiences of directly impacted people. In this particular moment, we are showing up across North Carolina as a state actor who um, stands in the gap for folks who are in the streets, who are protesting, who are organizing. We are educating the folks about the roles of, of elected criminal justice officials, and we are doing direct work. I just this morning was in Elizabeth City, uh, drove back from Elizabeth City this morning. I was arrested last week protesting, trying to help protect the constitutional rights of the people. Spent all, um, not last night, but the night before that, um, where several of my comrades and the people of Elizabeth City were specifically targeted and arrested by the Elizabeth City Police Department. Um, and they forced me to put on my uh, attorney's hat and represent folks and try to make sure that charges, try to argue real hard to make sure that the failure to disperse charges that they had blanketed these folks with were not certified. I was unsuccessful, but we'll get them in court. Uh, but that is just a little bit of what we do as an organization to hold folks accountable, but most importantly, to stand with the people and give them um, the sense of power that they need to understand their own power and then to use their own power. That is what we try to do. Arrested last week. Yeah. Uh, emancipate North Carolina. Yes. They put on your attorney's hat. Uh, I did. I got I on on that. Now, I was arrested last week, but with my attorney's hat on, was able to make, to convince the, the magistrate to decertify my charges and the person that I was arrested with. We were not charged, um, but I was arrested, but I was not as lucky uh, last week, this week, uh, with the folks down there. But yeah. Yeah. You better preach. Thank you for putting your body on the line. I have been there, uh, Dawn. I'm going to bring in my brother from Ohio, Prentice is in the house. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing all right. Can you explain Glad your organization and how you're showing up in this moment? Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. So uh, as Mike said earlier, my name is Prentice Haney. I am the co-executive director of the Ohio Organizing Collaborative. And, you know, 
what the Ohio Organizing Collective, what we do is simply put, we organize everyday Ohioans to build power around racial, economic justice in our state. And so when we think about that, you know, we start from the place, who are the folks who are being stripped of agency and dignity in our communities? And how, and how do we create real powerful political vehicles for them to take action inside of? And so inside the OOC and across the state, we focus on four constituencies to build power with and for. One is students and young people through our student organizing project. Um, we organize people of faith and we also are organizing um, formerly incarcerated individuals um, and then the families who have also been criminalized and brutalized by police. And, and last but not least, we also organize caregivers, care workers, and women, specifically women of color at the center of the care economy. Um, and so we believe that this crew of folks, these ride or die folks, mostly people of color, mostly black, a lot of folks don't know, but in Ohio, there's more black folks in Ohio than the state of Alabama. So when we talk about black America, we're talking about places like Ohio. Mm -hmm. That those voices in a place like Ohio, if a multiracial democracy can ever be achieved, it has to be achieved in a place like Ohio with people of color, specifically black people in leadership and in real power vehicles pushing for what they need. And so what I'm super excited about in this conversation is that, you know, because we're a power organization, we think about power, one of the biggest sort of um, threats to the power of people who are black is the police state. And so even though our work did not start around policing, so much of our work has evolved around um, reimagining community safety and the criminal justice system and policing because when we knocked on those doors around our first economic justice campaign with community change, actually, we asked people what they wanted to do. It's like, well, we want jobs, but we can't get jobs because we got, we got records. And then we ran Band of Box campaigns. And in the middle of our Band of Box campaign, Stay Your Ground was happening with Trayvon Martin. And so then we're fighting back against Trayvon Martin and then we're, and we're starting to learn about the criminal justice system and also how policing works. And so I'm, I'm just so excited that in the, um, the decade that we've been doing this work that we've learned a lot of lessons, a lot of hard lessons, have lost really powerful people, but we've had some really amazing um, police reforms that we're gonna push forth this year that I'm gonna talk about a little later. I mean, we've been fighting like that in Minneapolis for a while. We put on body cameras on cops, but it didn't stop them from killing us for eight and a half minutes while teenagers videotaped them on a corner on a holiday. You know, it, so while we can do these incremental changes, like how much we spend $200 million, $200 million on a police force in Minneapolis. Um, Ed, my brother in Michigan, uh, can you tell us about your organization and what you're doing to meet this moment? A whole lot of money, a whole lot of policies being talked about. What's happening in Michigan? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Genesis. Um, I am a directly impacted, formerly incarcerated black man born and raised in Gary, Indiana, now residing in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where I am the lead organizer for criminal justice transformation. Um, that's been a new word I've been using lately. Transformation implies uh, a dramatic change, uh, uh, like a restarting as, as opposed to reform. It's just making something better. I don't want to make it better. I want to um, do away with a lot of the um, racist constructs of um, not just myself, a lot of brothers and sisters out here on the ground. Michigan um, is one of the top. Um, you serve 140 percent of your time because um, you, you're constantly being flopped. And this is statistically. Um, so when we speak about mass incarceration, which is um, for anybody watching, Mass incarceration is, <clears throat> excuse me, America makes up just 5% of the nation's population, but makes up an alarm in almost 26% of incarcerated people. Out of these incarcerated people, they are disproportionately black and brown. Like myself, I have three felonies. Um, when I was approached by an organizer almost eight years ago, passing out popsicles and pizza in the neighborhood and thinking I'm giving back, uh, I was told that that's great to see a black man out here doing that. Um, there's a black woman. She approached me. She said, it's great to see that. I love to see it. However, 
do you know what mass incarceration and the school to prison pipeline is? And I had not heard of these terms. Mm -hmm. um, I followed her to a meeting and never went back. I never left, honestly. I was a volunteer for three and a half years. I learned about equity. And here in Kalamazoo, we had no parking, no stopping, no standing signs on a specific part of town, the predominantly black side of town where I resided. And um, I learned what equity was and we led a campaign. We got those signs removed and, and those signs were up for 20 years as a way to combat um, the, the, the drugs um, that were being sold in the early 90s when I first moved to Kalamazoo. But we got residents and community members to fight. And so that's what we do now. My team is a lot of a lot of directly impacted, formerly incarcerated black men. But we also have so many black women leading the movement. I'm proud to say my wife came along with me. She's now the vice mayor of Kalamazoo. Mm -hmm. The second black woman to be the vice mayor of Kalamazoo. Thank you. Uh, we're pushing power. We're pushing power and building power. And we we have a new initiative called Participatory Defense that is out of San Jose, California. But we had the opportunity of getting the training about three years ago in Detroit, using it here. And it's, it's simply teaching family members and community how to advocate properly. Um, one of the judges, a retired judge, told us too many times people are sentenced in empty courtrooms and that advocacy, it means a lot, especially when you have a court appointed lawyer, but we have teamed up with our public defender's office and we work hand in hand. with trying to reduce some of these sentences. And uh, that's what we're doing in Michigan in Kalamazoo. Thank you, Ed, appreciate you. Um, you know, uh, last summer, we saw some video of last summer, me out at the third precinct watching it burn. Um, after the brutal murder of George Floyd. Um, what did that moment mean for you personally and your organization? Um, I was there when the third precinct burned. I also was there when the verdict came in outside of Hennepin County. I have seen like this moment have a whole lot of black joy, but also black anger. What did this moment mean for you and your organization? I'm gonna start with you, Prentice. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a lot to unpack. I'll start with me and then I'll, I'll talk about the organization and what our response has been in the last year. Well, for me, um, you know, I remember, I remember feeling like I couldn't breathe the night, the day that I heard about George Floyd and I was in my bed and I, I, I couldn't even, I felt like I could not grasp my air, literally. And there's a way that this sort of trauma just like tries, literally tries to steal a life from you, even in just witnessing it, bearing witness to it tries to take your life. Um, and it's been, and, and, and to be honest, it's been a very hard journey because, um, you know, in Ohio, we've had a number of these shootings from, you know, from John Crawford III, who was 22 years old, shot and killed in the Walmart I was heading to that day to Sam DuBose at the U at Cincinnati. I mean, that's two, two miles from where I live now, you know, to to Mir Rice and, and so and countless names. And um, so much of my, my, my uh, membership, when I was a member leader, so much of my membership was connected to fighting justice for all these folks. And so my own body felt so tired of that, so tired of that. So when, when, when George Floyd happened, I made a conscious choice around what I was gonna do to make a difference in my community because I knew where that would take me because I, I, I had been there many times before. That's sort of like being paralyzed. But I chose not to be paralyzed or be in that shame and I stepped into my dignity and with the power of our organization, we were able to work with some families. Miss Samiria Rice in Cleveland and, and um, Alicia Kirkman, who's lost her son, um, Angelo Miller, in, 2000, in 2007 to a police involved shooting. Br uh, Brenda Bickerstaff, who lost her son, her, um, not her son, her brother, 17 years ago. They were fed up too, because they had seen that story, they had experienced that story themselves. And so they got together with us 
we were like, we're going to create some real oversight. It's time for some real accountability and real justice to happen in Cleveland. And so what we did from there through the fall was actually create one of the most powerful police oversight ballot and uh, charter amendments in the country that will give civilians, civilians like Ms. Rice who can sit on that board because it requires that um, the formerly incarcerated and directly impacted families from police involved shootings sit on the board and have a voice in the final authority around discipline for officers. It's creating real money in the community. Like, you know, one of the provisions in it is gonna be 0.5% of the division of police budget has to be allocated for regrant for grant making dollars for community based solutions to 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 uh, crime and policing and trauma informed care real resources that create safety in our communities right and so to put it short like i what what happened for me is that i said i wasn't going to sit in the shame i'm going to take this in, into the streets with the families are ready to fight yeah and so we took that to the streets we developed this and we're currently in our fight and it's actually sort of serendipitous and, and scary because the day we launched our campaign was april 20th a few oh, hours the day. yes the of, we, we the launched day. our campaign at 11 a.m eastern standard time two hours before i mean a couple hours before the derek chauvin verdict and then unfortunately a few you know a couple hours after that makia bryant was killed in columbus exactly. and so as sad as that is and we're fighting for all these folks all these children we were prepared and ready to put this forward. Thank you, Prentice. It, um, just as a black man in this country, I, I remember the joy of watching the verdict outside and then hearing the news of what happened in Ohio. I remember watching the trial and then seeing five miles away, a police officer killed Dante Wright, shooting him in the back while screaming taser. Uh, this is traumatic for Black people. And that's personally what, what I think Black folks have gone through in Minneapolis is trauma. Um, and uh, we're still living in it, even though we got a good verdict. Uh, Dawn, let me bring you in. The moment that it happened and what have you done over the past year, personally and organizationally? Um, Dawn, I know North Carolina is in the middle of it now, right? <laughs> yeah, we are, because less than 24 hours hours after the show verdict came down, uh, Andrew Brown in Elizabeth City was murdered um, execution style, literally shot in the back of his head by, uh, by a bunch of Pastor Tank sheriffs who showed up in the back of a pickup truck, literally, literally men hanging out um, that rang so familiar to lynch mobs and scenes of lynch mob that we have seen in documentaries and things like that. So being in North Carolina, being in the South, creates a very different um, dynamic around what you can do and what we what we are doing. Um, one of the things I can say is that I've been steeped in, and Emancipate NC has been steeped in police accountability work for probably 15, or 15, my goodness, I wish, uh, about five years since I took over as executive director of the organization um, and took it in kind of a radically different direction. Uh, what we know for sure is that when George Floyd was murdered, it was something of a perfect storm yes. for people to really address the harms and the ills of living in a police state for black and brown people because there was no way to look away there were no distractions we were all housebound because of covid we were working remotely so everyone was our only way to communicate and be connected was through some type of device some you know be that computer zoom tv so the entire country had to stop and watch George Floyd be murdered, right? Um, I think that that in that moment, what I knew was everyone's watching, everyone's paying attention. If something doesn't happen now, I don't know when a better time will be. When the Lord will present us with a better time to effectuate wide scale abolition. 
So myself, Emancipate C, a bunch of other organizations here in North Carolina and in Raleigh uh, quickly organized one of the largest protests that we've ever seen in um, in Raleigh, somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 5,000 people. We organized it in about, I don't know, in about 48 hours. And I would like to say that it was our great organizing skills that brought in that crowd, but it was not. It was the momentum of the moment. It was the horrific nature of the moment. It was people not being able to look away from the reality of black and brown people living in the police state. Um, from that moment, things have just continued to grow. What I feel personally now and what I felt then was the reality that my entire life had been preparing me for this moment. My entire life as a black woman who wanted to create a better country, fair, equitable, and reckoning with the harm that it has caused in America for black folks, this is the time for that to happen. So what I felt was this tremendous sense of, I've got to do something, this tremendous sense of drive. We have got to use this moment. We have got to harness this energy and we have got to use it in a way that is unapologetic, that is very, very honest and very truthful about what the harm is, who is being harmed, who is causing that harm and what is at the root of that harm. I live in North Carolina right now, but I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, but in North Carolina, North Carolina is the home. We were the first, the first colony in in what is now the United States to create slave patrols. The history, the birth of of metropolitan and police states started here in North Carolina, and because of that, we are dealing with very deep, deep roots that we have to pull up in order to extricate ourselves from the stranglehold of that police violence um, and that police sanctioned violence. So we are fighting and we are fighting every single day. And we are, we were, we got this, I, perfectly honest, are we talking about organizations? I'm gonna be real, real. So the white people were feeling real bad, right? So there was this flood of money that came in, right? Because that's what white folks do with their guilt, they monetize it, right? So I'm sure all of our organizations saw floods and floods of money. So now, not only have, have, have we created this moment where we have everyone looking, everyone captured, and everyone feeling the real pain of living in a state, set, in, in, in a police state. Now, organizations that are black led like, my, like mine have enough resources to be able to say and speak the truth the way we know it needs to be spoken in order to shake things up. So what we have been doing since then is using the power that we have both economic and the, the social platform to center the lived experiences of black people, center the lived experiences of people who have been directly incarcerated and use our money in a way that is anti-white patriarchal, which is what we have to fight so much against in the nonprofit industry and the nonprofit universe, right? Um, so we have, we have hired, um, I have a, a organizer, Kerwin Pittman, who is directly, who was incarcerated for 11, 11 years of his, of his young life, because he is less than 40. Um, been out less than three years, a powerhouse. A, a, the, a living, walking manifestation of how much resources we are losing because we are putting people in cages. Because he's an amazing person, an amazing organizer. He is doing amazing things. He is on the ground in Elizabeth City right now, organizing, getting people together, empowering the people of Elizabeth City, and reminding them of the power that they always had, but the community, but but the white power structure wanted them to forget about. We are also hiring lawyers. So we were part of, our organization was a part of a, one of the driving factors in a piece of litigation here in North Carolina uh, around COVID and incarceration, where we were ultimately able to force, force the prison system in the state to agree to release 3,500 people because they were not safe and they could not provide safe environments for them during COVID while they were also in cages. 
that is one of the largest, largest mass incarceration, de-incarceration wins, I think, in the nation. That is what we have been doing. We have been pushing the envelope. We have been pushing legislators. We have been pushing them to say, no, it is not okay for you to say to us, you are doing the best that you can. Push harder, do more, get more, demand more in this moment. And that is what we are doing. That's what we will continue to do. I feel like I'm, I went to church this morning, Dawn. Uh, if y'all didn't know y'all were going to church, you better ask somebody. We This is a uh, community change bringing the heat this morning. And uh, I, I want to bring you in uh, just quickly. Can you talk about personally on the day that George Floyd died and what that moment meant to you? And I'm going to ask the next question here. Yeah, uh, my body's tense right now. I, I tried actually talking to you offline, but but uh, you and Don had a different connection, but your last name. Um, so my government last name is Griffin. My name is Edward Griffin. My father's name was Leslie Griffin. He was killed by off-duty police officers in Gary, Indiana, 1977, September 13th, occurring in an unauthorized raid at 1030 at night. All off-duty police officers using non non-registered police guns and nobody went to jail. There's a popular magazine called the Chicago Magazine that did an article on this 1980. And it asks, why was Leslie Griffin killed? I have no idea why he was killed. I, I advocate, I, I speak about it. I also don't know anybody on his side of the family. So when I saw your last name was Griffin, I was like, I, I just instantly, but when you said where you were from and, and you and Don had that connection, it just kind of, um it, it silenced where i was going and so i said i'll talk to you offline and my my body has been tense since because yeah. when i saw the murder of george floyd i was able to tell my organization what what, what have i been telling you since i've been here um uh, we didn't have a criminal justice reform when i got to michigan united it was a mostly white um they started in um as michigan organizing project um focusing on housing they did they then went to immigration and there was hints of a campaign and the organizer who sought me out um and, and, and invested in me as a leader um knew that i had a story from having three felonies and my first felony at 17 by being beaten by the police in kalamazoo and i wasn't here a year and charged were resisting and obstructing the officer no other charge I, I i was not under arrest for anything uh i was 17 years old i weighed like maybe 130 130 pounds um and grown men beat the crap out of me and my cousin um because i yanked away and, and yeah i yanked away i wasn't from here it was culture shock i never had white people talk to me the way that they they were talking um so what came up for me personally was everything that I'm sharing right now. I, um, police brutality uh, wrecked my life. I, I grew up without a father in the inner city. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, Take your time, brother. Take your time. Yeah. Um, it, it, it wrecked me. And I, I also, I, I didn't even know what happened. My mother was scared. They were in their twenties, you know. Um, my mother and father were married three years before I was even conceived. He was he was a Kappa. He was in college, army, but he he also sold weed. He he was in the streets. Ain't no telling what he saw or did. I I I don't know. But the officers went there to 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 kill him. Um, and I I found this out in in my. I found this out as an, in my 11th grade year from my history teacher. He was the first person to tell me that my father was set up. And, um, wow. Um, this, this led to my research to finding out about the magazine, to watching George Floyd. It, 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 it hurt. It hurt so bad it, because it, it doesn't stop. It, it, it doesn't stop. It, it hurts so bad to see him calling for his mother. And um, his, his mother wasn't even alive. Right? Um, 
you you just will call out for anybody because they they will kill you they will kill you um and that's what came up for me um as far as the organization they gave me the lead way to do exactly what needs to be done um i i call the chief out personally all the time our last chief we pressured her so hard um she's quote unquote resigned they lied to us and said she was resigned but she actually got fired um for her mishandling of the black lives matter protest which was met with militarization of the police but then when the proud boys came to town they were escorted out by police and i wanted to know was she a member of the proud boys and a bunch of other questions and we got people to line up and, and keep asking those questions and, and i won't take up too much more time but i it's just this i i tried to keep it in i, I just couldn't I'm, I'm hearing everybody talk and i'm like wow this just it it wrecked me to see that last year it it totally like it shut my day down um like yeah they and i and i was fortunate the last thing i want to say is at 17 when I was finally subdued, it wasn't a knee, but it was a guy with his hands. While the rest of them hitting me and everything else is one of them that got his hand on my head and he telling me, you you don't yank away from office. We will kill you right now. Do you know that? And I, and I literally said, yes, I know it. I knew it within my body. I know it within my heart. That yes, they will kill me and my sons and anybody else. And that's what came up for me yeah thank thank you ed um you know there are stories like that around the country thank you ed for sharing that um it it's hard and the reason why we knew this was not just about george floyd was because about stories like that dawn talked about the perfect storm that happened with george floyd we had a perfect storm to put this killer cop in prison, including Keith Ellison, who won by a couple thousand votes, who built one heck of a politician of a campaign and a uh, lawyer to actually find him guilty. What do we need to do now? What do we need to do now to stop this from happening? To stop this story from happening? What do we need to do about the continued murders and police aggression to black people in this country. I've heard calls for defund, I've heard calls for abolish, reform. Can we needle this a little bit? Dawn, I'm gonna kick it to you. What can we do about the continual murder and police aggression against black people in this country? Uh, this system cannot be fixed. Um, it has got to be torn down abolished we have got to create something new um it is too deeply rooted in um in the ideologies of giving carte blanche control over black and brown bodies in a way that is um again it is not fixable it has to be demolished and i'm sorry i'm crying a story got me off listen i um I have literally lived my whole life for this moment. And so here's what we have to do. We have to abolish the system, but we have to believe that abolition is real. And let me be clear to y'all, we have seen abolition in every other in every other part of our lives systemically, right? We have seen them systematically ab abolish, demolish public education, right? They have defunded it to the point where it is almost non-existent. And then we watch them create an alternative system, charter schools, to put in its place. Don't tell me that abolition isn't real, because it is, right? That's the first thing. We got to convince ourselves that it is real and that it is achievable. The next thing we have to do is use all of our resources. And all of us, and when I say us, I mean Black folks. And I am speaking very specifically to my privileged black folks. I have a law degree. 
but I should not be the only lawyer that is the people's lawyer. I need you to put your privilege on the line for the advancement of all of our people. If we use, because listen to me, and it is so important, they are afraid of us. They are afraid of our power. That is why they stand on our necks physically and proverbially. Because they are afraid of what we can do if we come together collectively. If we give ourselves permission to feel the anger that we should feel in the way that we are dehumanized, in the way that we walk around with this trauma, in the fact that it literally physically kills us at a higher rate because we walk around with the stress of being black in America, mm. right? If they know, those folks in power, those white, they know that if it was them, they never would have fought for this as long as we had. Oh, please. That's yeah. what scares them. Imagine if white kids. Exactly. Use, we have got to use this moment, come together collectively, see the value in all of us, because there is real value and each and every one of us has a role in this revolution, and it is a revolution. In this revolution that is underfoot. And if we all do our part, we never have to hear another generational story like the one we just heard of black pain and black trauma and lives destroyed because we live in state in, in a in a in a in a car under a carceral system that is designed to destroy us. We can stop this, y'all. Mm. We can stop this. And thank you for mentioning how this police state started in North Carolina started with slave patrols. The history of policing in this country goes back to slave patrols. Let that sink in America. Slave patrols was where the police force started from. Uh, thank you, Dawn, for bringing us to church and taking us on a history lesson today. Uh, Princess, uh, can you talk about what we can do to make sure police stop killing black folks with their police aggression, defund, yeah. abolish, reform, what's happening? Yeah, I, I, well, first off, I just wanna thank Ed and Don for your honesty, your vulnerability. Um, so often folks in this work, organizers are, have to choose if they can show up, show it all. And you all showed it today. And oftentimes I, I don't show it because it's hard. It's hard, it's hard to come back. But people have to realize that this is this is a constant thing that we're moving through. This is a constant, it's just yeah. And so what I'll, I'll say this thing and then I'll answer that question. The other thing people need to realize is that organizers are warriors. We are warriors. And you know, folks who don't really understand what a warrior is, it's not like a soldier who is put on the field, told to do a thing, and they don't know that we are warriors because we are experienced and we're an experienced person that's engaging in warfare. Police are paramilitary organizations. We are literally in warfare. Organizers are using people in love and belonging to fight warfare. So when you see an organizer, when you see someone out in the community, see them as a warrior who, is, who has rigor, courage, they're aggressive about what they want, and they know there's a community to come home to. I'm committed to being that warrior in my community, which is why we have to be clear about what we're up against. And we have to be honest with our communities about what we can do today and what we must believe in that can exist tomorrow. Don said it. I, other thing that warriors do, or other thing that organizers do, we are hope dealers. We're helping people believe, believe things they don't see yet. Ain't that what faith is? Believing what you what, believing even if you can't see it yet. Come on now, somebody. Jump. Come on now. <laughs> somebody jump up us in this moment. 
How dare us not believe that we cannot exist beyond this moment? Mm. It's our belief with the act of being a warrior in a community that will actually dismantle the system. So there's a, some concrete things we do. We need, to, we need to bring every tool we got to dismantle this police system. If you got you a rock, bring your rock. Which means if you got if that means in your community that the first thing you got to do is oversight boards or stop um, no knock no knock raids or chokeholds, do that. If you got you a, a hammer, bring your hammer out. If that means in your community, what y'all got to do is fire these folks. You got to get into these police contracts, dismantle those police, police contracts. Come do that. If it means you got a bulldozer, bring your bulldozer. If that means like in Minnesota, that we got to get rid of the police department. Bring it all because guess what? Every one of those tools is taking down the thing that is trying to harm us. We all got a role. We all got a piece that we can do in it. And abolition is only abolition is believing that something else is possible, that we don't have to exist in what is today. Yes. It's not just abolition is not just about ending a thing. It's saying that this don't need to exist because we're midwife and something else. And so I believe we need to make sure we're clear about our roles, bring every tool you got, because this fight, you are a warrior. Remember that you are a warrior and that you come home to a community. And that's why we fight. We are warriors. Um, Ed, I'm going to pass it to you. Um, what do you think we can do uh, to stop murder, police aggression, Thank you for talking about the Griffin that was killed. I did not know that bit of history out in Gary. I will text my family right after this. There's not a lot of Griffins in the Midwest, so there's got to be some connection. All Black folks are related in somehow. So we are cousins, brothers. That is a family member of mine, and we hold that uh, near to my heart as well. Ed, I'm going to swing it to you. What can we do to stop this from happening? Thank you for uh, coming. I, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you all for um, allowing that grace. I, I didn't I didn't think I would get that emotional, um, but just talking about George Floyd and everything that got, boom, it just hit me. Um, so thank you all. Um, but um, I want to start backwards because I remember when I first started asking my mother, what can I do before organizing? I said, I feel like I'm supposed to be saying something and doing something. So I'm an artist professional MC, been on MTV, BET 106 in Park. I got songs placed on Forensics Files, George Lopez show, but I felt like I should have been doing more and saying more. And she said, well, allow God to use you as a vessel. So Prentice just said it. Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is a substance faith is the substance of things hold for the evidence of things not seen i got it tatted on my neck i really believe that i can show up and when i believe that i can show up i just started telling everybody i knew did you know that you can show up like you have a voice and, and and it might just be to these two three people at first but then it goes right over to what my sister Dawn lifted up and that is total abolishment all week that's all i've been very clear in telling law enforcement around here that hey my wife is in she's in on that side so y'all talk to her like that but me i'm very clear who y'all how y'all started where you got your origin from i just i got five thousand friends on facebook and they got so upset with me because i just left a video about slave patrols and the origin and the chief was like, oh, you, you launched a nuclear bomb on me in the community. No, I'm telling the community the truth because we should know why you believe you have the jurisdiction that you do, why you talk to us the way you do. And it's because there's, there's never been a true split. During the reconstruction period, birth of the Ku Klux Klan and birth of law enforcement, the legit law enforcement, no longer just slave patrols and stuff like that. Now they get to we're sanctioned and we got some money behind us and the people believe we're keeping them safe, but you make me feel unsafe. So what I told, I totally believe in not just defunding. First and foremost, we need um, accountability. And I mean, they need accountability as far as even knowing, do you know the role that you're taking on? No matter how many layers that it goes through, 
um, it's still the origin is what that is. And, and you can't erase that. You, you can't cover it up. And that's no disrespect to anybody who wants to be law enforcement or whatever and has tried their best to keep community safe in that type of way but if we don't know that everything in north america has been tainted by racism if we can't have those type of real conversations there's no real healing there's so many layers of trauma public schools did a number on me in gary indiana i learned so much bad stuff in in, in these underfunded schools and then when i think about the police there's it's not much difference if they don't have the funding they have attitudes like everybody else because they're human. We have to we have to be for real about the conversation about we are not slaves, even though the 13th Amendment allows for this loophole that says I when I was incarcerated that I was a slave. Well then who are the masters? And if these are the overseers and they're treating us this type of way, then a uh, resisting and obstructing officer is the new form of lynching. When they say stop and let me see your freedom papers and, and you don't stop or you question why am I being stopped and they can tase you, mace you, beat you and or kill you. We that we don't need more lawsuits. We don't need more uh, memorials. We prepare for a memorial here on the 25th. We don't need more memorials and more signs of Malice Green in Detroit and Rodney King and Brother Sean Bell in New York and my father in Gary, Indiana. We don't need any more uh, memorials, any more uh, money taken from them. We need to have the clear conversation that we are not slaves. Uh, uh, Y'all are no longer the masters. Uh, you are not the colonizers. And we got to have an equal conversation. Lastly, I want to say it's a small start here in Kalamazoo, but we have five blocks on the predominantly black side. Each block has a leader, a, a captain, a co-captain, a secretary, and a treasurer. And we're trying to self-govern ourselves, self-police ourselves, which will keep more, less police contact with our youth. We know how to talk to our youth. We can de-escalate a lot of these things before you can and probably escalate them. And that's we're just starting block by block. Um, and that's one of the things just, but as far as the police, yeah, I'm very clear slave patrol and I'm not a slave. Thank y'all to this powerful, powerful panel. Um, but this conversation is not over, uh, but that's all the time we have for this afternoon. Thanks to the guests for coming uh, and joining us. Uh, if you didn't catch the whole thing, don't worry, the link is going to be available immediately on Community Change Actions, Community Change Actions, social media, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. We invite you to like and share it with your network. Also sign our petition. We have these awesome Wednesday night parties um, called relational parties where you can text your friends and family. Join us on Wednesday night. Sign our petition, get more involved. From everyone at Community Change Action, thank you for joining us today and we will see you again soon.